Our dear viewers and listeners, we greet you all in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to today's Bible study. Coming to you from Dominion Church International Mbuya. It's an honor and a privilege to have you with us. And we kindly request you to invite somebody. Inform them that we are live now. Let them join us. And we are going to have a wonderful time as we get ministered to by the Holy Spirit. But before we begin, let's dedicate this moment to God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Yes, Lord. What a God you are to us, Heavenly Father. Yes, Lord. We yield to your grace your power, mm. your authority. Mm. Work in us a work only God can do in us, King of Kings. Yes, Lord. Amplify Jesus in the hearing of everyone. Yes, Lord. That hope, life, grace, and glory mm. might be made manifest. Yes, Lord. And after all is said and done, mm. we will give you the praise and the glory yes, for every testimony mm. in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 So, our text today will be taken from the book of Romans, chapter 6, from verse 12 to verse 14. This is what the text says. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its last. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. But present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. This text answers a very fundamental question in the life of many a believer in Jesus Christ. How do I live holy in this wayward world? How do I maintain holiness? How do I pursue holiness when the whole world seems to be going a different direction. The same text we can pick from the New Living Translation. And this is how it comes out. It says, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to its sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. This 
is something very fundamental for us. And here Paul opens up this text to a people who are living in Rome. Rome was the capital of the most influential empire of that time. And every imaginable sin and corruption could be found in Rome. Sorcery, idolatry were in Rome. Corruption, homosexuality was in Rome. Every imaginable spiritual filth could be found in Rome. Now Paul writes to them and I believe this has a bearing to us in the time that we are living in. And he commands them he instructs them and tells them not to let sin to reign in their mortal body. In other words, don't let sin control the way you live. The word or the verb that we use for reign is the Greek word basileo. Now basileo means to rule as a king. Or to exercise influence. So when Paul says don't let sin reign in your mortal body, the implication of this is that sin wants to exert it control. It wants to reign in our lives like a monarch would reign over their territory. You see, monarchs are not voted in and out. So once they are in, they are in throughout their lifetime. That is the objective of sin as well. Sin doesn't come in your life to only to be voted out. No, 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 no. It comes to reign. So we, when we come to Jesus Christ, we have been released from the dominant authority of sin over our lives. So what does sin do? Sin then seeks opportunities to try and re-exert that influence, to exercise power over us. So it is in that light that Paul writes to the church and to us not to let sin to control the way we live. Or to reign in our mortal bodies. In other words, don't even give it a foothold. Because it wants to establish a stronghold. Don't let it establish any kind of influence in your life. So what is Paul trying to explain? He is building on from what we saw in verse 11. Where he said, even so, reckon yourselves to be dead to sin. So then you're saying, consider yourself dead to sin. And the Greek word for consider is the Greek word logizomai. Which brings into the aspect of calculation. Or to compute. Or to count. 
So basically, do the math, calculate this out, and then come up with a conclusion. But in verse 12, he takes it even a step further. It is not just enough to come to that logical conclusion. He wants us to put our faith into action. It doesn't end with the truth. This truth must be acted upon. It is not enough just to check the box and say, okay, this I acknowledge, I believe this is true. In verse 12, it says, you must take that decisive step. Not to let sin to reign in your life. That responsibility, that command, is placed on our shoulders as believers in Jesus Christ. So what that means is that we must constantly continually fight against sin on an ongoing basis. So you can't outgrow this battle. This is something that you live with. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you are urged to fight for purity. And as you grow closer to the Lord, you will discover that this is a fight that you continually do. Now, this command is not directed to just the pastors or to the people who serve in several offices. This instruction is given to every believer in Jesus Christ. So we need to understand that though sin has been dethroned, nevertheless, it is still a powerful force. And there is still a battle within our mortal bodies. Which brings us to the next phrase where he says, in your mortal body. Now, mortal is the word thnetos. Thnetos. Thnetos means liable to die. So this body which is thnetos, which is liable to die, becomes the scene or the battleground where you do not have to let sin reign. So, although it is decaying and will be subject to death, the battle for personal holiness takes place in this body. So it will start with the mind, with our thoughts. The scriptures tell us that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It doesn't end with the mind. It gets hold of the eyes. What our eyes looking at every day. What is it that we allow our ears to listen to. So whatever is pumped into our ears in, in turn affects our mind. And eventually it affects our walk. It affects our tongue. Sin wants to reign in our mouth. How? By taking us to the place of slandering, of gossiping, of using foul language, of pulling down others, of bragging, of boasting. It wants even to take make use of our hands. So, 
so that what you pick, what you handle, what you use your hands for is for evil and not for good. It still wants to reign in our feet. It is to take us to carry out deeds. It is to take us to carry out to take us to carry out deeds. That we should not ideally do. The point is this. Sin wants to take full control of every faculty of your body. And the objective of that is that from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, every inch of your body is a target for sin. So this is not a battle happening in a mystical realm. No, this is happening right here. It is not detached from you. This is happening in this mortal body. So when we are regenerated, what happens, you may say? So when we are regenerated, we become a new creation. So the new person or this new man comes to live in an old body. So this new man who is residing in an old body, the new man is renewed. But the old body is unredeemed. And that is why when we die and go to heaven, we will put on a new body. Therefore, on this earth, we still have the three enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And sin will always try to re-establish reign. So this is not a battle outside of you. This is a battle that happens around us. In us. Enticing us to sin. And how does it do that? Paul points out in verse 12 that you may obey its last. So what it uses is the last. Last then becomes the trap that gets a hold of us. And here the, the writer in the New Living Translation says that do not give in to its sinful desires. So this comes as a desire. A desire to do something. A desire to possess. A desire to be different from what God ordained you to be. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16, the Bible breaks it down for us. As the last of the flesh, the last of the eyes, and the boastful pride of Life. Let me repeat it. The last of the flesh, the last of the eyes, and the prideful or boastful pride of life. Now, what is amazing is that even in Genesis, when man fell, it was last at work. The Bible says the woman saw. That this fruit was good to eat. Which is the last of the eyes she saw. And then she perceived that this was desirable to bring knowledge. You see, so now we are moving. So you have now the last of the eyes, now you have the last of the flesh, knowledge, then that whole pride of it. 
comes into context. No mubiri o take the katina malala mwegaitida. And then she said, uh, yeah, we eat. When we come to Jesus, in Matthew, chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, when the devil comes to him, again he begins to turn these stones into bread. And what is he trying to say? Bread appears to the flesh. And then we see him again. After he says, okay, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. Because the scriptures say, and what, uh, before he does that, he shows him all the continents of the world. He wants to see them in the glory that they are. And he, what is he doing? He's appearing to the last. And then he says, I'm going to give this all to you. And you will be the king, you will be in charge. Bow down and worship. And our Lord overcame him by the word. He was tempted in every way. Yet without sin. And he has now empowered those that follow him. To be able to overcome. Yes, they are strong. Yes, they create a longing in our hearts. But the Bible here tells us that we should not obey them. We should not give in to them. They will mask themselves in various forms. But we should not allow them to reign in our lives. Why? Because Christ is reigning in us. And they, these lusts are presenting themselves. But we must not let them reign in the body. And how is that possible? Which brings us to the first part of verse 13. And he says, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. Now, when you look at the New Living Translation, he says, do not let any part of your body, whatever part of your body, don't let it become an instrument of evil to sin. In other words, don't use any part of your body to serve sin. And this is a very negative prohibition. When he talks about members of your body, he's basically talking about every inch, every part of your body. Your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your nose, your feet, your hands. You say, don't, don't. Allow any part of your body. Not even an inch of it. Don't let it become an instrument of evil. Why? Because when it becomes an instrument of evil, the purpose that it will achieve, it will become a slave to sin. And what the, when we talk about instruments, the, the Greek word there is the word hoplon. Hoplon is like an instrument or a weapon that you use for war. 
bakubategeza echo kulwanyisa mu lutalo so it is like any part you surrender nga ekitundu kyo nacho kiriza no chire kati we okuwayo okiwayo to unrighteousness okola obutali butukirivu or to evil obokola obubi becomes a weapon and this weapon will now be used by sin that you are presenting to it. So what has happened? It is you, the individual, who has presented this part of your being to evil so that it is used as a weapon to be able to serve sin. Now, to try to think through it, before you come to Christ, you are a slave to sin. So, you enjoyed sin. You lived for sin. You lived to please sin. When you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, believe in his finished work, you have now dominion over sin. You have a new master. So it is within your ability not to surrender your body, not to hope on you, any part of your being for evil. Now, when he talks about presenting, he brings you back all the way to the Old Testament where the priests made sacrifices. So after they had killed the animal and prepared it, they would then present it at the altar as an offering for sin or for peace or whatever the function may be. Now that same approach of killing and presenting is the same approach that Paul brings here. When he talks about presenting our bodies, he wants you to understand what is happening. And he is saying, do not make this presentation. That is the negative aspect. And he's very clear, don't give in to the seduction of sin. Don't let sin reign in your life. It doesn't matter whether everybody is clapping to it. Don't let it reign in this mortal body. And having given us the negatives, all the way from verse 11, verse 12, he's, he's saying, don't, don't, don't. So the question is, what then do we do? And then that is where he comes in the second part of verse 13. And says what you need to do is to present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. The New Living Translation puts it this way. It says, instead, give yourselves completely to God. Every bit of your body, every aspect of your life, give it completely to God. Why? For you were dead. Now you have new life. I told you before. Sometime 
that what happened to us before we come to Jesus Christ we are dead to God and alive to sin. Now when we come to Jesus Christ we die to sin and now become alive to God. So now that we are alive to God it is not just our spirits that needs to be alive to God but we must take every faculty of our being every part of our Body. We must then bring it and surrender it to God. And the Bible tells us, use your whole body, not part of your body, your whole body, as an instrument, as a hope loan to do what is right for the glory of God. The question is, who are you glorifying? When you dress the way you're dressing, who gets the glory? When you speak the way you speak, who gets the glory? When you go where you are not supposed to, who are you glorifying? So, what, when you allow your eyes to look at what is faithful stuff, what is happening? If you are presenting that part of the body, to be, to give glory, to be an instrument of evil, and then it becomes a slave to sin. So, when the Bible tells us to present paristeni, to present. It is no different from what Paul is telling us. In Romans 12 verse 1. And we will look at it in detail when we get to that portion of scripture. But here he says, therefore brethren, I urge you by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. You present yourself. <coughs> this is a conscious act that you take. This is something that you do. So when you talk about presenting, it is to place something besides or to place a thing at another's disposal. So when you are presenting your body, you are presenting your body to God's disposal. You are coming to him and blessing yourself at his disposal. This is something that we do consciously. We must do it continuously. And we must do it purposefully. So it is not something that is happening by accident. It is not something you do once and then it is sorted so for all your entire lifetime, you don't need to present anything. The scriptures tell us to continually do it. And this, they use an aorist tense. So which 
implies that it is something that we do decisively. But again, it is intentional. And this is the way of life that we must live. Consciously presenting the members of our body to God. And he gives the comparison. He says as being alive from the dead. That is what every believer is. Dead to sin and alive to righteousness. So once you were spiritually dead, but now you are alive to God. So you have now the capacity to do what you could not previously do. You now have the capacity to live for righteousness. So every member of of your body should now be presented. And I will repeat that calls into consideration our minds, our eyes, our ears, our mouth, our hands, our feet. So whatever you're thinking, whatever you are looking at, what you hear, what you speak, your work, and your walk. All this must be presented. You cannot be saying even God understands. Yes, he understands and that is why he has empowered you. So at any given moment, any given day of your life, you are presenting your body. And there is no third category. You are either presenting it to God, you are presenting it to evil. So there is no middle ground here. So you are either pursuing God, you are pursuing sin. So you consciously make a decision. Either you give yourselves to God in this battle, all you give yourself to sin. So everywhere you look at it, Jesus understood this importance. Yes, So you may say, what, what, do, what, what, what has what I look at got to make any? Changing me. Say, I was just looking at it. But consider what Jesus says in Matthew. Chapter 5, verse 28. He says, I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Why? Because the eye is one of the key access points to the heart. And that's what Jesus is amplifying here. He says, you're looking then you make a decision. Then in your heart, your the act is already done. He's raised it to the higher degree. He's trying to tell us that the eye has access to the heart. So what you are gazing at will eventually grab a hold of your heart. 
Let me say it again. What you are gazing at, that which looks so innocent, will eventually get hold of your heart. In the next verse in Matthew chapter 5, he continues to say in verse 29, he says, if your right eye makes you stumble. Pull it out and throw it away from you. It is better to lose one of your parts than your whole body be thrown into hell. You see, well, he's bringing the point home that we must present every part of our body. We must present our eyes. Otherwise, if we will use what we see, to have access to our hearts. So let me ask a question. What is it that you are looking at? You see, those things that you're looking at that you do not want anybody to notice that you're looking at. There is a day I was, I went to do some shopping. And there is this middle-aged man seated by the shop. So he's seated outside. He has his phone in his hand. And he has those, those bags in his ears. And he's watching something. And I looked at him for some time. And then I realize he's looking at it and then he's looking around, then back. And I'm like, okay, why are you looking around? Why you don't want them to see what you're seeing? So what is it that you are seeing? That you are gazing at. <laughs> that you don't want others to watch. Could it be evil? Because when you do that, you are presenting a part of your body to evil. So that evil can use it to be able to serve sin. Like produces like. We become like what we gaze upon. So as a believer in Jesus Christ, when it comes to the use of our eyes, our eyes must be fixed on what is wholesome. What is pure that which edifies. Let's restrict ourselves. Let's draw boundaries to our lives. Make sure, just make a covenant with your eyes that you will not look at those things that you have been looking at. Make boundaries in your life that you don't go beyond this. Now you may say, but so-and-so is looking at it. You are not so-and-so. Sanctification is a personal journey. It is a journey that you make with the Holy Spirit. Where you decide to cut yourself from certain influences. And that is why some people are more sanctified than others. They have drawn further into God. They are drawn closer to God than many of their peers. Because amongst other things, they are not looking at what is not pure. 
baganyo kutunulire eyes from looking from gazing upon what is unwholesome so that means within it is it's not just the negative don't fix your eyes on this. Don't fix your eyes on this. No, we need the positive as well. We now must fix our eyes on Jesus. The book of Hebrews tells us, looking upon Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Looking Jesus. Jesus. Fix your eyes on his person. Fix your eyes on his finished work. Fix your eyes on the word of God. You see, when we gaze upon scripture, when we gaze upon the word of God, it aids us having a divine perspective about life. Our eyes begin to see things the way God sees them. Our eyes begin to see life for what it is. We begin to see people the way God sees them. We begin to notice the needs around us. We begin to see the opportunities that God has placed around us. We now begin to see life from a biblical perspective. So we now begin to see people without Christ for who they actually are. That they are helpless, that they are lost. We begin to see those people who are discouraged not as a laughing stock but as people who need to be encouraged. So you need, you now begin to see everything through the eyes of the divine. We now begin to step out and minister to the people. So do you know why we don't have many people today bearing testimony about salvation? Because they don't see other people as being lost. They are not looking at them through the eyes of eternity. Do you see that reason now? Why many people claim to be believers in Jesus Christ. Yet the fruit of their lives does not point to the same direction. The reason is this. One of them is that their eyes are gazed on the wrong stuff. Their eyes are not fixed on Jesus Christ. Saints of God, we are not designed to go through life blindfolded. We are meant to go through life with a divine perspective of our purpose on earth. So everything cannot be about me, me, me. We now begin to look outward. Who am I? Why am I here? Lord, what is your purpose? And then you align to the purposes of God. And begin to live your life in accordance to the purpose of God. So your eyes then are open. You now look at life in a different way. Light. 
Now it doesn't end with the eyes. Even the ears. And we will end at the ears and pick up with the other aspects as well. Now let's look at the ears. Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what you hear is very important. What you give attention to is very important because it is a doorway to growth. It brings an aspect of faith. It has a, a direct aspect to your growth in the spiritual. So if we allow the truth of scripture to come into our ears, if we speak the scripture, if we hear the scriptures, this brings about the growth in our faith. What happens if the opposite happens? When we allow our ears to give attention to everything other than what God is speaking, we then believe everything. No wonder the scripture tells us God comes to us in Isaiah and says who has believed our report? To whom has the hand of God been revealed? It is very important for to understand what it is we give attention to. So if you listen to slander, if you listen to gossip, it is going to affect you. So if you listen to whining, if you, all you are listening to is negative stuff, it is going to have a direct impact on your walk with the Lord. Similarly, if you give your ear, if you give your attention to scripture, it is going to affect your life. No wonder it is written in the book of Proverbs. And he writes, king, the king writes to his son and tells him, guard your heart with all diligence. For out of it flows the issues of life. Be on guard to what comes in. Not only through the gateway of the eyes, but also what comes in through the gateway of the ears. So we cannot be naive to sit and say, no, I will do anything I want to do the way I want to do it. And nothing will happen. Brethren, something will happen. Your work will be impacted. Not that you will lose your salvation. No. But what is happening is in this sanctified work, you will continuously be off track. And if you are not careful on this whole journey, you may give it up altogether and allow sin to dominate. So what began as a small thing, you letting evil, you surrendering a part of your life to evil, so that sin can use it to have control. Takes the entire you. 
Katimaliza chikuwa mje wena. Down the path of self-destruction. Na chikuzize kogenda muko kuzikirira. Now to the one who has never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Na yegwe nga tokiriza nga Christo Yesu kumufula muka mawo. This is your opportunity. Unomua ganya gubo. This is your moment. Kaseda kanoka kuhu. This is the moment to cross from death to life. Ke kaseda woso moko vemu kufa o yingiro vulamu. You now die to sin and become alive to God. In this moment, you lose the sin holds loses its dominion over your life. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. And now empowered. Do you know what? Empowered now to be able to resist. Empowered to be come to a position in your life where you do not let any part of your body be surrendered to sin. Where sin cannot control the way you live. So if you are watching us, if you are listening to us today, you have never given your life to Jesus Christ. Right now, I am inviting you to take this decision and surrender your life. It doesn't matter how long you have lived. It doesn't matter what has held your life. Captain, Jesus came to set the captives free. And when you invite him in your life, you will be set free in this moment. Why don't you say this prayer with me and invite him in your life? Say, God of heaven, creator of the universe, the lover of mankind, the redeemer of our souls. Here I come before you. I am a sinner. I have lived in sin. I have lived for sin. I have served sin with every faculty of my being. But here I am, Lord. I believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world. And today, I receive him as my Lord and personal Savior, as the Redeemer of my life. Lord of glory, help me to start afresh. Today, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And from this day forward, may my life, may every aspect of me be used as an instrument of righteousness wholly surrendered to you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. If you made that prayer from the bottom of your heart, in this moment, you have been saved. Now there is that number on your screen. I'm kindly requesting please call that number. Somebody on this side will pick it up. Give you those words of encouragement. Pray with you. Give you that direction the very first steps in this wonderful journey. And we love to hear from you. To hear what God has done in your life. Today, to get to hear of the stories of the life changes of the things, of the steps that you have taken on this journey of not letting sin control the way you live. The point is you can live holy in this 
hellish world you can live holy in this way world and by the spirit of God I pray that you be empowered to live for God that every part of your being be surrendered for this one purpose to give glory to give honor to our Lord Jesus Christ thank you Lord Thank you for listening to us. It's been a pleasure having you today. From Dominion Church, we are praying and requesting that we meet again next week. God richly bless you. Shalom.